Okay, good morning everybody, this is Dustin. Welcome back to uh, Bushwhacking History in Buffalo with Berserker Bear. So, a lot of talk lately about the timeline, what's going on with the timeline. History, all that jazz. What is history? We call it his story, as in his story. We got timelines here. What I'm going to show you real quick, I'm going to try to lay out my opinion on if there was any era epic of history his story that was fluffed in my opinion it was Byzantium a thousand years from uh, about per this timeline which is in a book that I have right here with me called living world history from 1969 1450 to about the 400s. You got a thousand years there where they were managing the empire of Rome from the east, from Istanbul, Constantinople, against the Muslim invasion, and they attribute it to technology namely Greek fire that I've done before, and administrative reform. So this is hip fire here. I have no script on this one. Rarely do I ever make myself a script, but come to my IG. Again, my auxiliary research is here. Another book that I have. So we're going to end this video with a reading from the book that I just cited. I also have this one. Ages or a great ages of man, Byzantium. We're not going to look into that one because that whole book is about Byzantium. I have that for reference. If anybody's interested in that, hit me up for professional solicitation. We can um, communicate via email, and I will uh, go into this book further. But right now, for what's going on. In this video, what I want to uh, put out there, we're going to be citing from this book. And I want you guys to check out my post right here on IG. Now, if you check this one out and go to the following ones, excuse me, chronologically, this is the pages in that book that detail the Byzantine period. Some of my handwriting notes are in there. This is just to showcase or provide you what I have in small um, increments, if you will. I, obviously, I can't say this is very tedious work to do when I pull book uh, pictures from my books. I'm real um, meticulous about it, so I got to crop them and everything. Anyway, let's read what I said and we'll, we'll paint um, a narrative or I will try to argue my point. Okay, so this is from my IG post from a couple days ago, about four days ago. This will be followed by a chronological post of the pages from this book on the Byzantine period for you to read and discern for yourself what I propose. In my humble opinion, if there was any time added to the historical timeline, it may have been added to this time period. Byzantium. I have serious doubts that a series of attributed weak emperors, administrative reforms, and clerical changes were able to fend off the encroaching Muslim caliphate for 1,000 years. Even with Greek Greece fire. Look at what's currently happened in the Pax Americana, not even 300 years in. Was it always just Pax Romana? Rebranded, and is it now truly in a death blossom? Question mark. So that's my idea that I think as far as Byzantine. Now I'm going to uh, give some um, argumentative examples of that. Namely, I, I do cite one in here. I believe this was my like uh, preview for this video that I'm doing right now. If there's any, it's Fugazi. Not necessarily meaning that it didn't happen. Okay, when I say Fugazi. 
I'm not saying that it was completely contrived and made up. I think that it was, that, like we say in this uh, alternative history research, it was time was added. What time, when, who knows? It just appears to me that there's no way they can fend off that Muslim caliphate for a thousand years just with Greek fire. And even though this was an um, unbelievable, unbelievably guarded uh, place, Constantinople, check out the walls. Now, these are all pictures from books that I have. So these are the walls of Constantinople. And you get a sense of scale by seeing that dude right there. So not only did they have, it was like a terracing of rampart walls. So massive defensive. But that doesn't stop a Muslim caliphate, you know, or neither does uh, these guys. So uh, the pictures that I'm showing here, and also I'm going to play a reading at the end of this, we're going to tail it out with about a 15-minute reading from that book that I just showed you, um, the Living World History. Okay, now I, I'm going to read some excerpts from that one. Actually, as a matter of fact, we can just show it to you right now where I'm going to be reading from. Byzantium Fugazi. So I will read. You'll hear me read this page. And you can read along if you want because I'm going to play the video that I made. And... Um, this page and this page. So what they attribute the thousand year reign of Byzantium to is uh, a series of uh, clerical reforms and administrative changes that took the uh, power away from the governors and the, uh, the broader lands of the Eastern Roman Empire, we call Byzantium, and uh, folk, uh, centralized it actually in Constantinople. And they, they attribute that to being able to hold off the caliphate of the Muslims also, Greek fire was said to be one of the texts that was used to fend off that uh, the encroaching Muslim army. And I've done that before. We've got it right here. There goes a trireme. So what I put out before a couple of videos ago on Greek fire, I, I don't think this was just used. They had, obviously, they had portable ones that's probably used on the terra, on citadels also. In my opinion, that could be what we see as melting, in my opinion. So let's round out this narrative here because I want to try to explain a little bit more. Also, we're going to go over at the end some clips from uh, old CF apps. Um, much love to that dude, rest in peace, homie, video about... Um, Mystery Hill. I showcased this in my last interview with Michelle Gibson. These clips from one of his videos from In Search of with Leonard Nimoy back in the day that proposed the idea uh, from Barry Fell that Phoenicians and the Basques had settled America circa 1000 BC. Now, I also like to cite a video from Michelle Gibson, a couple of hers back, where she did Jamestown, Virginia. And uh, to me, that just looks like uh, this is not. This is Jamestown, Virginia, 1907 exposition. They had that port there. To me, that looks like what I put right here. Again, this is on my IG. The port at 15 minutes in the Michelle Gibson's Jamestown video looks vaguely similar to a Phoenician Kothan ring port. Many of the northeast cities on the shores of the Great Lakes have similar layouts. Cleveland, Buffalo, Chicago, even the D, you know, Detroit, holler. Um, wonder if they were actually Kothan ports 1.5K years ago. That's what I'm putting out here. So if Byzantium was stretched, you know, was it really 1K years ago? And my idea is mud flood this, mud flood that, Tartaria this, Tartaria that. I'm saying that being flippant, but I'm also being a little bit more nailing down of uh, proper definitions. Tartaria was a tribe in Siberia. I don't believe that there was all one uh, global liquefaction mud flood. I think it was all done in segments. Philip and I have talked about this before. And I think that it's mud flood might be indicative of overgrowth of trees and just sediment, sedimentation. And I, I've discussed that before. So we're going to play some clips of that at the end and then I'll do my reading. But let's still hammer out the idea that 
Byzantium may have been fluffed. Now, I'm a big fan of uh, other channels, of course, obviously, but let's do some hip fire here. YouTube. I'm a big fan of Pockets of the Future. Okay, now I'm going to try to uh, argue an idea that I've thought of listening to him. He, go, he goes, he does um, Babylon News, if you will, and goes at celebrities, this and that. But there was one time when he was going after, not going after, just professionally poking fun. Paul always keeps it above board. So that said, it was Madonna's turn uh, for the raking. Madam um, expiration date, as Paul calls her, which is hilarious. And it was there was kind of like a Wiccan-esque ceremony kind of before Halloween. Maybe this is like a month ago. And she was dressed in this giddy-up, and she had referred to herself as a Byzantine goddess. Now, that piqued my ear. Uh, check Paul out. Give him some love. Dude crushes. Also, Apocalypse, his other channel, is really good. So, back to Byzantine. I believe that there's a certain part of celebrity or the thespians or Hollywood that placates to this Byzantine period because you're going to hear in the reading that it was, I hate to use the word debaucherous and I'm not um, putting this time period up as a target because of the way that it was looked at, for example, in like um, academic, uh, from an academic perspective, because you're going to hear that it was kind of, when I say debaucherous, I mean, it was a uh, Man, I guess you use the word now, bougie. Okay, that's not the reason why I ping this era to be possibly fluffed or fugazi. There's a couple different reasons. Number one is I don't believe that they were able to hold off that Muslim. That's probably the number one thing for a thousand years because I, I look at it in the context of now and how supply chains are, are being stressed now. And as far as what you want to call Pax Americana, that hasn't even lasted for 300 years. You're telling me that a civilization that was Byzantium-esque was able to hold off the Muslims for 1,000 years? When you keep, when you again look at context of what's going on now in supply chains, you know I cite supply chains a good real-world example of how you can look to and cite it uh, across history is Rommel versus Monty in Northern Africa. Allegedly, the reason is per history that Rommel lost his momentum was because of his supply chains were stretched out too far, and Monty seen that, uh, countered it, and flanked him, and um, that's history. So supply chains are key. Now, not only that, they rely on the, the Greek fire aspect of the of uh, the whole thing, saying that it was uh, a technology that was able to fend off the when they were uh, on. Like I cited, I think in the 670s when they were attacked by the, another Muslim onslaught and they used the naval Greek fire. They literally attribute their existence for so long to one piece of technology that if you watch, look at the movie 300, it cites that the Persians had throwing incendiaries in that time period. And that's like 200, 300 BC. BC. So... Things don't add up when, you know, when you say the obfuscation of history and they say that this tech, as far as Greek fire, came on the scene at the time of, well, let's just see, the onslaught of um, of Istanbul. And they were able to uh, fend off that the Muslims with that specific technology. And again, we say Greek fire. I say po possibly was a mixture of Greece being mixed with water for a never-ending fuel source. But anyway, so attributed to one technology, also a series of uh, systematic and uh, clerical reforms in the actual kingdom itself is what is they attribute to being uh, allowing Byzantine to rule for 1,000 years after the fall of the, the Republic of Rome. So in my opinion, I don't want to get too far into this, and I hope I'm not being too confusing here, but I just want to put my my plant my flag. I don't plant my flag on much things, but I will on this one, and I'll say that I think 
if any time period of history was fluffed, it was Byzantium. So hopefully that would get you on your quest or your Gulliver's Travels to check that out. That's all I wanted to say about the timeline. So let's get into Barry Fell. Here we go. I'm going to play all this. Enjoy. Harvard archaeologist Barry Fell has spent years studying inscriptions and drawings from Mystery Hill and other unexplained ruins in North America. Now what about some of these inscriptions that have been found? Uh, what do they indicate in terms of people's presences in this area? Where are they from? Well, they really tell us that America in ancient times was a melting pot of the races of Europe just as it is today. Same peoples, peoples from uh, all parts of Europe and North Africa, living together, even speaking their own languages side by side and writing their own inscriptions and their own writing systems. What people came here? Uh, Basques from Portugal, Celts from Spain and Portugal, uh, Phoenicians from uh, Carthage and probably from Phoenicia itself in Syria, and ancient Egyptian traders too. Why do you think these people came here? Uh, probably initially by accident. Fishermen, you know, the Portuguese people are wonderful deep sea fishermen and inevitably a fisherman is going to be blown away from land in a storm. A uh, fisherman knows how to look after himself when he's blown out to sea and in modern times very long voyages have been performed that way. So initially accidentally, later deliberately. He and Fell pursue another line. In other words, there's no doubt in your mind that ancient people from the Mediterranean area came and settled in New England, among other places. No doubt at all. They probably settled all that part of North America that could be reached by ship. That is to say, the whole Mississippi Valley and the branches of the Mississippi. The Mediterranean. At one time, Knossos was her capital, a jewel-like city on the island of Crete. All that's left now are the weather-worn ruins of graceful temples, courtyards, and apartments. The people of this island were called Minoans. They were heirs to Phoenician sea kings who sailed here from what is now Lebanon. The Minoans loved music and art almost as much as they loved the sea. Even their architecture had a lyrical quality. The sea never seemed far from their thoughts. They must have gloried in all its aspects. The sea brought the Minoans power and wealth. Perhaps they had commerce with other advanced civilizations now lost to us. Strange visitors to the new world. Professor Fell, how do your colleagues at Harvard feel about these amazing discoveries you've made? <laughs> Very mixed feelings. My closest colleagues, who of course uh, support my work and, uh, and assist me in it, uh, have very positive feelings, and uh, some other colleagues, uh, more particularly concerned with traditional aspects of archaeology, uh, so far have not supported my opinion. Hmm, I wonder why. Well, how did the ancient Phoenicians get here? They had ships, like a are better than those available to Columbus. Here is a carving of the hull of one of them that we found at Mount Hope, Rhode Island. We have one other carving from another part of North America. And then the fact that they made the voyages is sufficiently plain from the inscriptions that they left en route. The inscriptions Professor Fell refers to are found in abundance at Mystery Hill, if one knows what to look for. ...has found his answer to the puzzle of Mystery Hill. From a small island in the Mediterranean to a hilltop in New Hampshire, it must have been an incredible journey. Everything feels right and seems to fit. The style of masonry is the same. The walled lanes are common to Knossos. One could almost imagine being on Crete if it weren't for the Yankee accents and pine trees. Many will find it hard to believe the implications of Professor Fell's painstaking research. This guy just say Yankee? How dare he? Search for the results of the carbon dating. But the late summer of 1976 saw two distinguished researchers joining the ranks of those who support the Minoan theory. And there were indications of more hard evidence to come. Skeptics abound in every culture. The Minoans may have found it difficult to believe there was much of a future here in America. It must have seemed so primitive. Perhaps that's why they vanished. Yeah, perhaps. The Phoenicians had been present as miners and as traders, mining tin in that area for many, many years, even before their alliance with the Israelites. The Tuatha de Dan An. Let me, uh, let me preface this. Uh, this is a different, this is now a lecture of Stephen M. Collins on the lost 10 tribes of Israel found first heard about this one from the uh, the golden ladle channel way back well actually we might look it up if I have time not sure but I want to give a shout out to the YouTube channel golden ladle I first heard Stephen M Collins lecture about this from that channel holler at that dude
Send your love. Let them know who sent you. The Phoenicians have been present as miners and as traders, mining tin in that area for many, many years, even before their alliance with the Israelites. The Tuatha de Dan An, or part of the tribe of Dan, obviously, arrived as well in the British Isles, principally in Ireland. When Samaria fell, though, most did not go a journey that far. That would have been a pretty rigorous sea voyage, especially if you're bringing your wives and kids with you. A lot went a shorter distance to Carthage, which I'll have more on later, too. But I want to give you a surprise, or since you've read my book, probably isn't that much of a surprise to this audience. But evidence exists that most of the Israelites did not go into captivity, nor did they make sea voyages to new lands, but instead migrated via land and conquered a new homeland in the Black Sea region. In 1875, an official of Queen Victoria's British government, Colonel Gawler, wrote a treatise called Our Scythian Ancestors Identified with Israel, citing many classical and medieval sources that most of the ten tribes migrated north of Armenia and became the Scythians or Sake of the Greek records by the Black Sea. Ortelius, who was a 16th century geographer for the Spanish king, wrote that when the Israelites migrated into the Caucasus, they took the name Gothi, which the Romans later called Goths. A medieval Jewish writer by the name of Eldad recorded, and I'm going to read his quote in direct quotes here, many Israelites did not go into captivity, but evaded the calamity, going off with their flocks and turning nomads and that the chief or prince whom they appointed could muster 120,000 horsemen and 100,000 foot soldiers. So with an armed escort of a quarter of a million men, now if you figure 10,000 for a division, that's quite a few armed divisions going up in terms of armed strength. This mass of Israelites, when they brought their wives and the children with you, the whole mass of people, easily numbered one or two million, perhaps more. The Bible shows several prophets had warned the ten tribes that Assyria would conquer Israel if the nation was going to fall. Since millions left voluntarily, either by land or by sea, the Encyclopedia Judaica also acknowledges that Hebrews, or Israelites from Palestine, were with the, uh, the Phoenicians when they founded Carthage. Carthage grew strong and rich. They had such a powerful navy that for centuries they forbid the Greeks and Romans to even go out into the Atlantic. That was their private playground, their private domain, because they exploited the Atlantic world for their own wealth. And Carthage was known as an incredibly wealthy city. Carthage had Gibraltar, or as they call it, the Pillars of Hercules. That's one of the gates of their enemies, which is one of the promises that God gave Abraham for his seed. Frederick Pohl's book, Atlantic Crossings Before Columbus, quotes two Greek accounts of Carthage's secret Atlantic land. So they learned about it. They just couldn't go see it. One is a fairly respected source, Aristotle. He states, in the sea outside the pillars of Hercules, the Carthaginians found a wilderness with navigable rivers. Carthage, the master of the Western Ocean, which meant the Atlantic, observed that many people attracted by the fertile soil and pleasant climate resided there. Carthage decreed no one else under penalty of death would be allowed. No one else under penalty of death would be allowed to sail there. They kept the land secret. Another Greek writer wrote, there lies a very great island in the vast ocean, many days sail westward from Africa. The soil is fruitful, a great part of it is mountainous, but there's a large plain watered with several navigable rivers, you know, the Mississippi, the Missouri, the Ohio, etc. The mountainous part is clothed. Tried showing the Kothans, okay, just to give you an idea. The very large woods. Well, obviously, this is North America, and the Greek histories also record that the Carthaginians sent fleets, etc. The mountainous part is clothed with very large woods. Well, obviously, this is North America, and the Greek histories also record that the Carthaginians sent fleets with tens of thousands of settlers out through the pillars of Hercules. They assumed they were going to colonies in Africa or Europe, but frankly, there isn't a population base there to indicate that that is where they went. And uh, now, through the work of Barry Fell and the Epigraphic Society, we know a lot of those colonists came to our side of the Atlantic. Carthaginian. Okay, so I just wanted to, to let you guys know that that information is out there, and I did talk about that with Michelle Gibson on my interview with her called um, An Interview Named Sue. Because we were talking about the Sioux Locks and the Sioux Dam uh, over over yonder. Off the top of my head, I can't think about it. So, anyway, uh, in my opinion, if anything was fluffed in history, a Fugazi time period in history, uh, Byzantium. And I'm not putting, uh, this is my argument. I'm not giving you definitive proof. How that plays into, you know, the Basques and the Phoenicians being here, boy, I don't know. And if anything... It can't all be covered up. I, so if those Basques and the Phoenicians were here, what I'm saying is mud flood might be the, the overgrowth of that. I talked about that with Woody, the whole LIDAR thing, uh, Wood and Nichols, like how they find more Mayan civilization by using LIDAR, similar to what they do in Egypt. Okay, It doesn't make sense to me that this place, Constantinople, was able to fend off the Muslim horde, they call it, whatever. It might even have been the uh, southern tip of the Silk Road of uh, Tatar, if you will. If I can say that, don't get aggravated at me, Philip. Uh, I still appreciate, homie. Um, so, yeah, let me just uh, round it out by saying, keep in mind that this place, North America, might have been colonized 100, or I'm sorry, 1,000K years ago. That information is there. It's accessible. It's accredited because uh, Harvard anthropologist there, Barry Fell, you know, has done work on it. They found artifacts mystery hill i've done that before i'm just kind of putting an opening another path for you guys to look at so when i say i'm making an argument i'm not giving you a definitive argument i'm just proposing other options 
mud flood might be overgrowth and it might be a backfill and literally uh, cities just being covered physically purposely it's a process a technology if you will and if the basques and the phoenicians were here 1k bc maybe greek fire was too maybe these citadels that we see being burned or melted if you will were just sprayed with pitch burned and left for the stains of time or the dust of time okay byzantium seems fluffed to me in my opinion and look up the work of barry fell stephen m collins the lost 10 tribes of israel found and you'll see that possibly the questions that i'm proposing here might have some merit okay and you know you got to be able to get yourself into a place where you can say tartaria shmaria mud flood schmud flood and pin down some real solid definitions and research here not saying that anybody who are using those terms still is is not doing that that's not what i'm saying whatsoever because i still respect and there's much love for everybody um i say that just to let you guys know where i'm at with my research i still um have very much respect for the whole tartaria mud flood this is what i got into it for but i think it's there's a little bit more to it okay and it's there it's might it might be ruins and we're going to work further on this but let's finish off with my reading i appreciate you guys coming by at the end of this reading this is a 15 minute reading from this book about the byzantine period so you can listen you can read what i read and discern for yourself so this was bushwhack in history in buffalo byzantium may have been fluffed phoenicians and basques and whoever else might have been here in the new world 1k bc is the new world the true old world i'll plant my flag on that one too much love to everybody hit like share subscribe keep it sleuthing i'll report back For centuries, the Byzantine Empire served as a buffer for Europe against Muslim invasions. Byzantine rulers like Justinian and his wife Theodora left, sought to preserve the traditions of the Roman Empire, although Rome itself had fallen to barbarians. For their part, the Muslims created a dynamic new culture based on the religion of Islam. Caravans, like the one at the right, carried the word of the Prophet Muhammad to the peoples from Spain to the Far East. The universal verdict of history is that the Byzantine Empire constitutes, without a single exception, the most thoroughly base and despicable form that civilization has yet assumed. So wrote the famous 19th century British historian W.E.H. Lakey. His disapproval of Byzantine civilization reflected the strict moral standards of England during the reign of Queen Victoria. The word Byzantine had long been used to suggest moral corruption and political intrigue. Present day historians can agree with Leakey that there was much that was evil in the Byzantine Empire. However, no civilization can endure a thousand years as did the Byzantine, without elements of greatness. In the last few decades, historians have shown increased respect for the splendid cultural heritage the Byzantines left the Western world. The Muslim Empire was far larger than the Byzantine, though its civilization was relatively short-lived. Muslim scientists and philosophers were among the most illustrious of medieval times. Islam, one of the world's great religions, is an enduring monument to the faded glory of this once proud empire. The early Russians did not build a state comparable to the Byzantines or the Muslims. Under leadership of the city of Kiev, 
the Russian city-states enjoyed a modest commercial and agricultural prosperity until domestic conflict and foreign invasion disrupted a promising beginning. The Principality of Moscow then revived the Russians and forged a new nation. This chapter traces fortunes of three civilizations from their origins, showing their relationship to each other and to the medieval West. The chapter is divided into five parts. Number one, the Eastern Empire survived the fall of Rome. Number two, the Byzantines made notable contributions in many fields. Number three, the Muslim Empire arose from the religion of Islam. Number four, the Muslims created an advanced civilization. Number five, a Slavic state began on the Russian plain. Number one, the Eastern Empire survived the fall of Rome. In the southeastern corner of Europe on a strategic peninsula between the Black Sea and the approaches to the Aegean Sea lies a Turkish city of Istanbul. On its site, a Greek colony called Byzantium was established in the 7th century BC. In 196 AD, it fell under Roman control. Constantine, Emperor of Rome from 306 to 337 AD, ordered a new city built there. And in 330, it became the second capital of the Roman Empire known as Constantinople or the city of Constantine. It eventually emerged as a thriving metropolis center of the, a new civilization, sometimes labeled late Roman, but usually called Byzantine after the original Greek settlement. The Byzantine Empire was the continuation of the Roman Empire after the death of Emperor Theodosius in 395. Two emperors ruled the Roman Empire one in the east and one in the west. While Germanic chieftains carved out kingdoms in Italy, Spain, and North Africa, Constantinople, as the center of Roman rule in the eastern provinces, stood firm. The city was protected on three sides by water, and on a fourth side, massive walls offered virtual impregnable barrier to would-be conquerors. Justinian restored Roman greatness. During the 6th century, the power and grandeur of the Roman of Rome was briefly revived by the Emperor Justinian, who ruled from 527 to 565. In a brilliant campaign, the Vandal Kingdom in North Africa was destroyed and a foothold was gained in southeast Spain, the farthest west the farthest west that Byz Byzantine rule ever penetrated. Another military expedition was launched against Ostrogoths in Italy, and after many years of desperate fighting, Byzantine authority was established. But in the process of restoring imperial control, Italy was devastated. The fields lay untilled, cities fell into ruin, famine and disease stalked the stricken land, Justinian's triumphs were hollow, were hollow mockery to the population he had rescued from barbarian domination. Late in the 6th century, the Lombards, a Germanic tribe, established their own kingdom in Italy. Justinian's most enduring contribution to Western civilization was his preservation of the Roman law in a systemic form. He organized a commission of lawyers to revise and codify the law of great Roman jurists. This code was supplemented by the Digest and the Institutes, two works which express the philosophy of law as understood in Justinian's time. Roman law, which otherwise might have been lost, was therefore preserved for hundreds of years, passed on to posterity. Another of Justinian's memorable achievements was the magnificent church of Hagia Sophia, meaning 
holy wisdom in Constantinople, a triumph of Byzantine architecture. It was built at a tremendous cost by the labor of thousands of workers and artisans. The emperor also lavished funds on roads, aqueducts, public buildings, and other civic projects. He helped to make the capital city one of the wonders of the Middle Ages. Far larger and more beautiful than any metropolis in Western Europe. For all the splendor and pomp of his rule, at his death Justinian left a realm dangerously weakened by his extravagant ambitions. The tre treasury was exhausted and the outposts of the overextended empire in the west were difficult to defend. In mustering his resources to reclaim the lost territories of Rome, Justinian had neglected the eastern provinces which were periodically attacked by Persians, Slavs, Bulgars, and others. The eastern empire became Byzantine. In the years after Justinian's death, the painfully acquired Western Empire was eaten away by further barbarian conquests. Only Sicily, portions of Italy, and several Mediterranean islands remained. Syria, Palestine, and Egypt added to the core territory of Asia Minor, and the southern Balkans constituted the Eastern Empire. The concept of a united Roman Empire was never entirely discarded, but by the 8th century, the Eastern Empire developed a civilization more Hellenic and Oriental than Roman. In medieval Europe, Greek was unknown language except to few learned monks. But to the Byzantine population, largely Greek, but including Slav, Syrians, Jews, and others, it was the national tongue. Latin was reserved for state documents and official functions until 7th century when it was discarded for even these formal occasions. The Greek classics form the basis of Byzantine literature. The Oriental tradition of the Byzantine Empire came from the ancient empires of Persia and Mesopotamia. Eastern customs were reflected in the elaborate etiquette at the royal court and the lavish ceremonies associated with the semi-divine status of the emperor. Northeastern influences were also important. Roman influence was obvious in the law and in the political tradition of imperial authority. The empire was also Christian, but the Byzantine church evolved in a pattern of different that of the Western Empire. The Byzantines withstood many invaders. Periods of imperial instability and economic decline alternated with periods of political strength and commercial prosperity. There were few great emperors to expert effective leadership. And the safety of the empire was often threatened by external enemies. Yet for 10 yet they were able to fend off doesn't make sense to me. This is a key point here. Centuries, like an island fortress in a raging sea, the empire was often threatened by external enemies. Yet, for ten centuries, like an island fortress in a raging sea, the Byzantine capital withstood numerous attempts to breach its inner defenses. The outer ramparts were repeatedly attacked and sometimes taken. In the seventh century, the emperor Heraclius, a great general in his own right, ended the Persian threat and recovered Syria, Palestine, and Egypt. But a new menace soon replaced the old Muslim Arabs. By the end of the 7th century, the Muslims had conquered North Africa, the eastern Mediterranean lands, and parts of Asia Minor. The Balkans also came under attack by the Bulgars, a nomadic people similar to the Huns who subjected the Slavic population and subjugated the pop Slavic population and settled in what is now Bulgaria. 
under Leo III, who ruled from 717 to 741, the Byzantine Empire regained its strength. He increased imperial authority by weakening the power of provincial governors. This administrative reform is credited with prolonging the life of the empire. A Muslim army was repulsed at the very gates of Constantinople, 717-718, and Byzantine navy drove off the invaders' fleet. A vital element in Byzantine naval success over the years was the use of Greek fire, an inflammable liquid containing lime, sulfur, and other chemicals which set fire to enemy ships. Another outstanding ruler, Basil II, who ruled from 976 to 1025, revived the power and prosperity of the empire after a long period of decline. He became known as the Bulgar Slayer because of his ruthless conquest of the Bulgars. On one occasion, thousands of Bulgars were blinded and only a handful left with a single eye to guide the rest home. The Bulgarian king is said to have died of shock when, his, when this sightless multitude returned. But once the fighting was over, Basil acted in statesmanlike fashion, giving the Bulgar self-rule in the empire. As so often happened after the reign of a strong empire, emperor, the empire lapsed into another era of decay following the death of Basil. New commercial rivals, notably city-state of Venice, offered serious competition to Byzantine trade in the eastern Mediterranean, and a foe more powerful than the Persians or the Bulgars appeared from Central Asia, the Seljuk Turks. After the Turks routed a Byzantine army in Manzikert in 1071, the whole of Asia Minor was overrun by these hardy invaders. Constantinople suffered a crushing blow in 1204 when the Fourth Crusade was diverted from a campaign against Muslim Turks to an invasion of the city itself. Christian crusaders looted the great city in an orgy of destruction. Priceless art, treasures were pillaged, and a vast quantity of rich booty was carried away. A French noble of the Fourth Crusade described the downfall of the city. The great churches and the richest places melting and falling in, and the great streets filled with merchandise burning in the flames. The booty gained was so great that none could tell you the end of it. Gold and silver and vessels and precious stones and cloth of silk and ermine and every choicest thing found upon the earth. Never since the world was created had so much booty been won in a city. End reading. Okay, what's up? So I'm back. I just wanted to give you guys a little bit of a montage while that reading was going and just to tell this out, give you a heads up. Those were my Greek fire pictures and mixed in with uh, that book that I cited that I have, The Great Ages of Man. I just threw together a montage for you, whatever. Now, you can follow along with that reading because I, I kind of tailed off of the actual the book because I didn't realize it was cropped out because my OBS operating system doesn't put the whole page in view. So I'm sorry about that. But you can come to my IG, which is cool, because like I said in this post, boom, boom, and I, I did or I identified my opinion on Byzantine period being fluffed. And I hope that you, uh, when you listen to that, you can see my angle on it. It seems like it's just a bunch of BS. Also check out Jaronism's recent in-depth on the timeline. That's Jaronism. He did a real good one also for, on, on Fomenko's work. So now you could have read along, you could read along with that if open up a couple pages, listen to my reading, and these pages right here are what I read. Okay, the first section, when I say it was a lesson, this is a textbook, 1969 textbook, my father's, 
shout out to dad. But so you go from this page, this page, this page, that page. That's what I read. So you can read along. All right. That was uh, bushwhacking the timeline for Zerker Bear. I will report back. As I said before, watch your six out there. Keep it smooth.